Welcome to Advanced Calculus Real Analysis Lecture 4, Chapter 2, Convergent Sequences, Section 2.1, The Convergence of Sequences. We are using the text Advanced Calculus by Patrick M. Fitzpatrick, Second Edition. This is Dr. Gilbert Iyabi. Section 2.1, The Convergence of Sequences. Now, while the two main topics in the analysis of real valued functions of a real variable are differentiation and integration of functions that have as their domain an interval of real numbers, the study of sequences is essential for number one, an understanding of infinite series of numbers and functions, and secondly, the study of continuity, differentiation, and integration of general functions. So in this entire chapter, we will deal with sequences. Subsection 2.1.1 definition. A sequence of real numbers is a real valued function whose domain is the set of natural numbers. Now for notation, instead of using the common notation for functions f, mapping from the set of natural numbers to the set of real numbers, we would represent a sequence as a set of all a n, where n is an index, n is a natural number, and for the sake of simplicity, we would just represent a sequence as a set of all a n. a n is a function from the set of natural numbers to the set of real numbers. Now, what is n? n is called the index for the sequence a n, and a n itself is called the nth term of the sequence. A sequence is defined by its nth term. Let's check out a few examples very quickly. Number one, the sequence one over n. For each index n, the nth term is one over n. So we could ask you to find the first four terms of the sequence. It will be one, one half, one third, and one fourth. So for every natural number n, the nth term a n equals one over n. So a twenty five would be one over twenty five. A fifty would be one over fifty. Take a second example. The set of all elements that are of the form one plus negative one raised to the power n. The end term is one plus negative one raised to the power n. So I can find the first four terms. The first term would be when n equals 1. When n equals 1, I have 1 plus negative 1, which is 0. The second term would be when n equals 2, and that would be 1 plus 1, because negative 1 squared is 1, and that would give me 2. And the third term would be 0, and so on and so forth. The end term is 1 plus negative 1 to the n. Well, you can see something interesting developing. What would be a raised to the power 2k? 2k means even, and 2k plus 1 means all. So if I raise negative 1 to an even power, what happens? And what would be the result of that term? If I raise negative 1 to an odd power, what happens? And what would be the result of that term? I would leave that for you to figure out. Next, let's look at what is called a recursive sequence. Define a1 to be 1 and a n plus 1 to be a n plus 1 over n if a n squared is less than or equal to 2 and a n minus 1 over n if a n squared is greater than 2. You see here that the n plus 1 term is defined with respect to the n term and only a1 is actually defined explicitly. So a1 squared is 1 squared, which is 1, and that is less than or equal to 2. So a2 would follow this formula right here, a1 plus 1 over 1, and that gives us 2. I square this, and that gives me 4, which is greater than 2. So a3 would follow this formula right here, and so on, and so forth. Another example would be the sequence of partial sums. Let r be a real number, 
define the sequence of partial sums Sn by Sn equals summation k from 1 to n r to the k for every natural number n. Observe that S1 would just be summation k from 1 to 1 rk, which is just r raised to the power 1. S2 would be summation k from 1 to 2 rk, which would be r to the 1 plus r squared, and so on and so forth. So you can see that Sn is a sequence of partial sum. Now also observe that if r equals 1, then Sn is simply summation k from 1 to n of 1, which is adding 1 n times, and that will give us a sum n. Now if r is different from 1, then I can apply my geometric sum formula, one of the tools we saw back in chapter 1, and Sn would be r minus r to the n plus 1 divided by 1 minus r. Recall that for the geometric sum formula, we had k going from 0 to n. Now k is going from 1. So you can play around with the formula and you end up with r minus r n plus 1 divided by 1 minus r. And the last example we would look at would be another sequence of partial sums. Sn defined by Sn equals summation k from 1 to n, 1 over k, where n is a natural number. I want you to remember this because we shall come back to it later. This sequence, as beautiful as it looks, does not converge. And we shall talk about that later. Subsection 2.1.3 Convergence Definition A sequence a n is said to converge to a number a provided that for every positive number epsilon, there is an index n such that the absolute value of a n minus a is less than epsilon for all indices n greater than or equal to our n that we found right here, i.e. the limit as n approaches infinity of a n equals a if and only if for every epsilon greater than zero, I can find a natural number n, uppercase n, such that the absolute value of a n minus a is less than epsilon whenever n is bigger than or equal to n, uppercase n. In other words, from the index n, uppercase n, and above, the distance between a n and a is very negligible. Remember that epsilon is usually a very small number. That is the same as saying that for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a natural number n, uppercase n, such that a minus epsilon is less than a n, which is less than a plus epsilon, for every n greater than or equal to our found natural number n. And again, that is the same as saying that for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a natural number n such that a n is in the open interval a minus epsilon a plus epsilon for every n greater than or equal to n. So from the index n, uppercase n, all the values of a n are in this small interval for a very small epsilon. If that happens, then it means the sequence a n actually converges to the number a. So in proofs, this is what we will be interested in. I'm going to pick an epsilon at random that's greater than zero, and the task would be to find such a natural number n that would satisfy this inequality for every n greater than or equal to the n that we just found. If a sequence a n converges, it cannot converge to more than one point. Okay, And I'm going to leave the proof of that as a simple exercise for serious students. So what I want you to do is, Suppose a n converges to the point a, and it also converges to the point a prime. Can you prove that a has to be equal to a prime? 
use proof by contradiction. It shouldn't be difficult at all. Now, here comes our first proof in this section. Subsection 2.1.4 proposition. The sequence 1 over n converges to 0, i.e., limit as n approaches infinity of 1 over n equals 0. Okay, let's follow the procedure as I explained a few seconds ago. Proof. Our n term is 1 over n, and the limit of the sequence is 0. That's what we're saying. So how do we perform the proof? Let epsilon greater than 0 be given. Our task is to find a natural number n such that the absolute value of 1 over n minus 0 is less than epsilon for every n greater than or equal to the big N that we just found. So we want to find a natural number n such that absolute value of 1 over n, because 1 over n minus 0 is just 1 over n, will be less than epsilon for every n greater than or equal to uppercase n. But since n is greater than or equal to 1, 1 over n is positive, and the absolute value of a positive number is the same positive number, so we can ignore the absolute value, and we just have 1 divided by n less than epsilon for every n greater than or equal to n. So that's where we're going. Now, but epsilon greater than 0 by the Archimedean property of real numbers, again, one of the tools we saw back in chapter 1, we can select an index n, that's the n we're looking for. We have to find it, and we just found it. But epsilon greater than zero by the Archimedean property of real numbers, we can select an n, a natural number, such that one divided by n is less than epsilon. Call that equation plus. Now, we want to prove that one over n is less than epsilon for every natural number n greater than or equal to the uppercase n that we just found by the Archimedean property. But what does it mean for n to be greater than or equal to n? So now, for every n greater than or equal to n, 1 over n is less than or equal to 1 over uppercase n. n by inequality plus 1 divided by uppercase n is less than epsilon. So this inequality chain holds. And what we are really saying is that for every epsilon greater than 0, we have found an index n, a natural number n, such that whenever n is greater than or equal to uppercase n, 1 over n is less than epsilon. And that is the definition of convergence. And we are done. Therefore, we can conclude for every epsilon greater than 0, there is a natural number n such that the absolute value of 1 over n minus 0 equals 1 over n is less than 1 over n, less than epsilon. All of these, I'm just repeating this inequality chain right here. And that happens for every n greater than or equal to uppercase n, i.e. 1 over n converges to 0. We would use this notation often to refer to convergence. A n converges to A, 1 over n converges to 0, end of proof. We're going to try one more example to see if you can get in the flow. Another example, use the epsilon n definition of convergence to prove that the sequence 2 divided by n squared plus 4 divided by n plus 3 converges to 3. The definition I gave above is known as the epsilon n definition. Recall it says, for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a natural number n. So it's called the epsilon n definition of convergence. Let's follow the procedure one more time. Proof. Let epsilon greater than zero be given. Our task is to find a natural number n such that the absolute value of 2 divided by n squared plus 4 divided by n plus 3 minus 3 is less than epsilon 
for every n greater than or equal to our uppercase n which we found. The trick here is always to take this value that is in the absolute value sign to the saloon and give it a facelift. Put it in a way that we would use it easily. Let's go back to the first example. See what we did. This quantity that was in the absolute value sign, we started off by deleting our zero and then finally we eliminated the absolute value sign and we were left with just one over n. And it was very easy for us to proceed after we had rephrased the question without the absolute value sign. So let's do the same thing for this problem. Observe that the absolute value of 2 divided by n squared plus 4 divided by n plus 3 minus 3 equals, I can cancel out the 3 and the negative 3, and I'm left with 2 divided by n squared plus 4 divided by n, all of that absolute value. But n again is greater than or equal to 1, so n is positive, n squared is positive, the sum of two positive numbers is a positive number, so we can actually eliminate the absolute value sign. And that leaves us with 2 divided by n squared plus 4 divided by n. And furthermore, n squared is greater than or equal to n for every natural number n. And if I invert that, I would have 1 over n squared is less than or equal to 1 over n. And if I multiply 2 on both sides, I would have 2 divided by n squared is less than or equal to 2 divided by n. So bring that back here. 2 divided by n squared plus 4 divided by n would be less than or equal to this quantity right here. The first component is less than or equal to 2 divided by n plus I just copy the second component. I have a new first component plus the second component that gives me 6 divided by n. So I have successfully written absolute value of 2 over n squared plus 4 over n plus 3 minus 3 as less than or equal to 6 divided by n. And put a pause right there. We shall come back to that. Okay, let's proceed with the proof. Again, epsilon greater than 0 implies that epsilon divided by 6 is greater than 0. We could divide it by anything. It would still be greater than 0. By the Archimedean property, since epsilon over 6 is greater than 0, I can always find a natural number n such that 1 over n is less than epsilon over 6. Or, if I multiply both sides by 6, 6 is positive, so the inequality sign does not change. I have 6 divided by n, uppercase n, less than epsilon, and I call this plus plus. Now, I go back to what I want to prove. I want to prove that absolute value of 2 over n squared plus 4 over n plus 3 minus 3 is less than epsilon for every n greater than or equal to uppercase n. Now, this quantity is less than or equal to, we just showed that here, 6 divided by n. But for every n greater than or equal to n, if I invert that, 1 over n will be less than or equal to 1 over uppercase n. And if I multiply both sides by 6, I end up with 6 divided by n is less than or equal to 6 divided by uppercase n. So this absolute value is less than or equal to 6 over n. But 6 over n is less than or equal to 6 divided by uppercase n. But again, from plus plus, 6 divided by uppercase n is less than epsilon. Hey, what have we done? We just proved that this absolute value is less than epsilon. And when does that happen? It happens whenever n is greater than or equal to uppercase n. So let's put our results together. For every epsilon greater than zero, we have found a natural number n such that the absolute value of 2 divided by n squared plus 4 divided by n plus 3 minus 3 is less than epsilon for every n greater than or equal to n. 
Therefore, our conclusion is that this sequence converges to 3 by the epsilon n definition of convergence, and the proof is done. You are probably thinking of another example at about this point. Yes, there is one more. Use the epsilon n definition of convergence of a sequence to prove that this sequence converges to negative 5, i.e. the limit as n goes to infinity of this sequence equals negative 5. Proof. I would leave that as sieves. That means simple exercise for serious students. Just follow the procedure from the previous example, and let's see how far you go. If you encounter any problems you cannot solve, just let me know, and I will be more than willing to help you. Okay, let's tackle some other very interesting concepts from this section. Subsection 2.1.5, Comparison Criterion for Convergence. We would, after now, just call it the Comparison Lemma. Let the sequence AN converge to the number A. Then the sequence BN converges. You can add a little S right here. Sorry about that. Then the sequence BN converges to the number B if there is a non-negative number C and an index N1 such that the absolute value of BN minus B is less than or equal to C times the absolute value of a n minus a for all indices n greater than or equal to n1. In other words, if a n converges to a, and I can write the absolute value of b n minus b in this form where c is a non-negative real number, then I can conclude that b n also converges to b. Okay? This is the comparison lemma. Once I know of the convergence of AN, I can conclude the convergence of BN, provided C is a non-negative real number. Let's prove that. Proof. Recall that we want to prove that BN converges to B. Okay, That is what we want to prove. We want to prove that BN converges to B. I.e., if I pick an epsilon that is greater than zero, I want to find a natural number n such that the absolute value of bn minus b is less than epsilon for every n greater than or equal to n. Call that star. That is what we want to prove. But we are given a couple of things. We do know that c is greater than or equal to zero and that this inequality holds. So let's see how that plays into the proof. We are given that there is a non-negative real number C and that there is a natural number N1 such that the absolute value of BN minus B is less than or equal to C times AN minus A. And that happens for every N greater than or equal to N1. Call that one. Now, if C equals zero, then 1, this inequality here, simply implies that inequality star holds, in which case Bn converges to B and we are done. And all we have to do is, the N we are looking for is just going to be N1, and life is good, as easy as that. Now what happens if C is not 0? If C is not 0, then C would have to be greater than 0, because C is greater than or equal to 0. So, suppose C is greater than 0, then epsilon over C is also greater than 0. But we are told that A n converges to A by the epsilon n definition of the convergence of the sequence A n. Since epsilon over C is greater than 0, I can always find an integer n2 such that the absolute value of a n minus a is less than epsilon over c for every n greater than or equal to n2. I haven't done anything here. I just applied the epsilon n definition of convergence on my sequence a n because it converges to a. 
Now, define n to be the maximum of n1, n2. n1 was the natural number that permitted this inequality to hold. n2 is the natural number that also permits this inequality to hold. So let n be the maximum of both natural numbers. Then, for every natural number n greater than or equal to my newly found n, this inequality is true. Absolute value of bn minus b would be less than or equal to c times the absolute value of an minus a. But that is going to be less than c times epsilon over c from this other inequality because my chosen n is maximum of both n1 and n2, so it holds in both cases. So this will be less than c times epsilon over c, and my c would cancel out. Remember, c is greater than 0, so the inequality sign doesn't change, and that equals epsilon. So what we have effectively done is pick an epsilon greater than 0, we found a natural number n, which was the maximum of n1 and n2, such that the absolute value of bn minus b is less than epsilon for every n greater than or equal to our found n. And by the epsilon n definition of convergence, that means the sequence bn converges to the number b end of proof. We would pause the lecture at this point and call it part one of lecture four. When we resume, we would look at part two, which covers the sum limit theorem right down to the polynomial property. Thank you and God bless you.